Last year, the cashier told me my card was not approved. Now I'm tipping the servers hundreds to show my gratitude. Easy. You are locked on fantasy basketball. Your daily fantasy basketball podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Basketball Monster. My name is Josh Lloyd and I am the lead fantasy analyst at basketballmonster.com and you can find me on Twitter as always at redrock underscore b-ball. Today we're looking at the Memphis Grizzlies and their 2018-19 season, what the summer holds for them in free agency and the future of a lot of their players. Michael Bolton, he is pumped. Let's get to it. To it. Let's get to it indeed. First of all, the Grizzlies, let's go through their particulars. 33 and 49 this season. They currently sit in the eighth spot for the, the lottery. Now, that pick could move if uh, their first round pick is protected one to eight. If it goes outside that top eight, it does go to the Boston Celtics. So if any of the uh, Dallas pick, Minnesota, Lakers, Charlotte, Miami, or the uh, Sacramento slash Boston pick jump up into the lottery, into those top four spots, Memphis then moves down to number nine and they lose that pick and it ends up going to the... um, to the Celtics in that situation. That pick next season is protected one to six, and then after that, it's unprotected. The Grizzlies, I think, would really much prefer to see that pick go this year to give up pick nine rather than potentially pick seven next year or unprotected unprotected the year after in what is considered a weak draft this season. So I think that they would be hoping that someone can leapfrog, leapfrog them, get into that top four, and push them down to number nine, enabling them to get that obligation out of the way now so they don't have to worry about it in future seasons. Moving forward in terms of uh, draft picks, this uh, other draft picks this season, well, their second round pick has gone to the Chicago Bulls as part of the Justin Holiday deal. So they're just dealing with that number one, that pick, that which could be that pick eight. They could get into the top four there, or they could lose that pick overall to the... Um, overall to the Boston Celtics. So there is a risk that they end up having no picks during this draft uh, at all. So that would be uh, not great for a team that's currently sitting in their spot. They still have the odds to jump up. 6% chance of the number one pick, 26% chance of getting into the top four. So still a chance that they can get themselves a, a pretty handy selection coming up in this uh, in this upcoming NBA draft. In terms of uh, free agency and how this squad's uh, books look, they, uh, they don't have a huge amount of uh, of cap space moving forward. In fact, they've got a lot of guaranteed money on the books. They have, uh, at the way things currently stand with their squad, they can't actually get uh, decent enough cap space outside of you know, minimums and exceptions. So no, no ability to uh, to do there. They're almost you know, pushing up to the uh, to the luxury tax at, at this point. They have, because you know, they've got big contracts like Mike Conley, Chandler Parsons on the books. Now, there are a few things that they can do. There's Jonas Valanciunas, who has a $17.5 million player option. I imagine he will pick that up after being traded uh, from the Toronto Raptors. There's Justin Holiday, who's an unrestricted free agent. There's Joachim Noah, who's an unrestricted free agent. There's Tyler Zeller, who's an unrestricted free agent. I reckon they'd like to bring uh, they'd like to bring Noah back at, at minimum if they can. He provided enough, but guys like Zeller and even Holiday, who was a real bust after coming over for Chicago, he's no guarantee to return. They have two unrestricted, uh, two restricted guys. Sorry. Uh, Dillon Wright, who came across in part of that Marcus Soul trade, and Tyler Dorsey, they're both coming across at the trade deadline. They will bring Wright back, I'm almost uh, certain of that. Dorsey, yeah, probably they'll look to bring him back as well. A couple of non-guaranteed guys, Dylan Brooksy Brooks, who missed nearly all of this season with a toe injury, he is non-guaranteed. Bruno Caboclo, his deal is also non-guaranteed for this season, but I think both of those guys did enough. Um, during their time, Brooks in his rookie season, Caboclo in that little uh, run at the end of the season to have their contracts guaranteed. These, this team is not going to be, they're not going to be players uh, moving forward in the free agency market for this season. So there is still, you know, there is still uh, you know, some, some ideas that they'll be looking to bring those guys back. In terms of those uh, non-guaranteed guys, Avery Bradley has $2 million guaranteed of his $13 million contract for next season. So there's a chance. And look, he played really well in Memphis. He was shit house last season for the Clippers and the season before for Detroit, but he was really good in Memphis. But there is uh, an ability for them to cut him and just pay him the $2 million. Whereas uh, I think Bruno's uh, entire contract and uh, Dylan, Dylan Brooks's that entire contract is non-guaranteed. It's just Avery Bradley 
who has the uh, the partial guarantee on his deal. Javon Carter also has a partial guarantee on his deal. You've got Ivan Rab. There's a team option on his contract as well. He was okay. I would imagine they would pick up that for $1.6 million. So overall, you know, the only real question mark there is what Valanchunas does. That could free up a ton of cap space for this team if he declines that player option. And the Avery Bradley situation with that uh, two million dollars guaranteed could open up a, a little bit of extra room for them, but probably not uh, not a huge amount there. So this squad almost appears locked in. But I would bank on anything that Mike Conley is not with this team by the end of next season. I think he will be traded in this off season. Now, whether it's to Utah, to Indiana, to who knows, to Dallas. I, I don't think that Conley is going to be on this team at the beginning of next season, and he sure as shit won't be on this team at the end of next season. He is due $32.5 million this season, and then has a $34.5 million player option. So you're on the hook for a bit under $70 million for the next two seasons. He's really good. I'm not sure he's worth $70 million over the next two seasons, especially considering he'll be uh, 33 and a half, 34 years of age by the time that player option season is over. But I, I really don't imagine that Conley is going to be on this squad at the beginning of the season. So that opens things up and brings the likelihood of someone like Delon Wright and Tyler Dorsey, those guys coming back on this squad if Conley isn't around. They played with the slowest pace in the entire NBA. They're still looking for a new head coach, by the way. JB Bickerstaff should never have been hired and then was fired. Even though they did show some significant improvements at the end of the season, Bickerstaff shouldn't have been there and he, he's not there. 30th in pace, 27th in offense, 9th in defense at the very Grizzlies uh, run of things, the way that things look. 6th in the NBA in steals, 4th in the NBA in blocks. Really good at that defensive sort of stuff. Uh, limiting opposition two-point attempts and uh, and two-point percentage, which is not ideal. You actually want teams to be taking more two-point attempts. Um, they are you know, mid-pack in terms of allowing threes. Also, their three-point shooting was not good. 25th in percentage, 25th in attempts. They need to get up more threes. Overall, they took the fewest field goal attempts in the entire NBA and the lowest scoring offense in the entire NBA as well, just 103.5%. Didn't shoot the ball all that well. 51% uh, effective field goal percentage as a team. So obviously a, a lot to work on with this squad and they did a lot of that damage. Well, a lot of that stuff happened when Marcus Gasol was on the team and he is no longer on the team. A lot of uh, season ending injuries. Jonas Valanciunas didn't play at the end of the year with an ankle sprain. That's not a significant one, but Jaron Jackson Jr. missed a lot of time with the quad. That won't be a concern moving forward. While Kyle Anderson, a little bit worried about his shoulder, which did cause him to miss the end of the season. Avery Bradley had a shin problem as well uh, and CJ Miles with a foot issue and Dylan Brooks, of course, that toe which ruled him out at the beginning of the season. Let's look at these players now in more detail. Conley, a real good bounce back from him, played 70 games, 34 minutes a game. He was the 28th ranked player overall in fantasy. He was a guy that I was big on as a big bounce back player this season. I, I am happy to announce that I got that one right. 21, 3.5 and, and 6.5 and with 1.3 steals on 44 and 85%. He was a guy that a few years ago was generating two steals a game. That's never going to come back for Conley at the age of uh, 31 and a half where he currently sits. But this scoring ability, it's it's strong now if he does get traded, which I do imagine. I, I'm not sure he maintains a 28% usage and 21 points per game situation, but I could see him being a, a 19 and 8 sort of a guy alongside Donovan Mitchell in Utah. He could be that player. Maybe he can concentrate a little bit more on getting those steal numbers up. But overall, he feels like at least a top 40 player for the next two seasons moving forward. And then after that, the decline could be somewhat of an issue. But a huge bounce back from Conley, just doing what he does. Exactly the same sort of a player that he was before that Achilles injury wrecked his season. Not an Achilles tear, that Achilles slash heel injury wrecked his 2017-18 season. He is very, very good. He had a plus 2.93 PIPM, by far the best on this team. Added uh, Wins added over 8 on off of plus 6.4, led the team in all those areas pretty comfortably, unless you're counting the plus 10 of CJ Miles in his uh, his limited minutes or the plus 8.4 of Utah Watanabe in their limited minutes. But the regular rotation guys, Conley was by far the, uh, the standout on this team. Passes the ball, shoots the ball, plays pretty good defense. I thought it was a really strong season from Conley, but we do have to be worried about a decline coming and a change in scenery potentially limiting his overall output. I think if we're, we're banking on what Conley's going to do, he, he's not going to be on this team next year, and that's going to have somewhat of an impact and age-related decline is going to come. So I would expect that this 28th rank for Conley this season is probably the best he has in his career. My boy, Jonas Valanciunas, an absolute monster second half of the season. 
buried in Toronto to begin the year. Now his per minute numbers in Toronto were excellent, uh, and then when he then he broke his hand, then he got traded and came back for Memphis and looked awesome. Only 49 games and only 22 minutes. 15 and a half and eight and a half over a block, 56 and 80, true shooting of 62%, half a steal. These are really, really great numbers from Valanciunas. In his time in Memphis, 28 minutes a night, 20 and 11 with two assists and 1.6 blocks on, again, true shooting of 60%, usage of 30. I think he'll pick up that player option. I think he'll be the starting center for this team. And I think that he'll be able to put up a top 50 season next season. He was putting up, and I've said this for years and years and years, Give this guy 30 minutes a night and he will be a top 50 guy. And we saw that this year, but even he elevated his play to a significant level. His per 36 numbers were the best of his career. His previous best per 36 was 20 and 14. This year, 25 and 14. Really upping the usage, really taking advantage of the opportunities he was given. Improved defensively. One of the best block rates of his career, efficiency right up there, the best passing season of his career. He was absolutely fantastic for this team when he came across. And to be honest, even in Toronto, he was pretty strong. A plus 1.5 on-off for Valanciunas. A positive PIPM 0.88. I'm really looking forward to what he's going to do next season. So much can change in the offseason with what they do in terms of positioning and where they're playing. But I imagine he comes back as the starting center, 27, 26 minutes a night. And that firmly puts him in the top 80, probably top 70, probably top 50, to be honest, with how this team is structured and how much he's going to have to carry offensively. But really, really good stuff from Jonas Valanciunas. Uh, this this season, especially that second half. My man, Jaron Jackson Jr., only 58 games as a rookie, only 26 minutes, 14 and five. Those five rebounds is, is poor. 0.93s, 1.4 blocks, one steal, 51 and 77, with a true shooting of 59. Now, true shooting of 59 as a rookie is impressive. I didn't like the way Bickerstaff used him. I thought he was overly cautious with fouls. Now, foul trouble was a problem for Jackson. There's no doubt about that. But Bickerstaff was also overly cautious, wouldn't put him back in. And even in games when he didn't have foul trouble, his minutes were kept under wraps. I think next season we see him push to at least 29 minutes a night. Foul trouble will still be a problem, and that might reduce his block rate, but I think he's got a real shot at the top 50 next season. You know that I think he can peak as a top 25 player. He was a marginal negative in PIPM this season, negative 0.39, but I do think that he will be uh, significantly better than that as he uh, as he moves forward. And uh, as guys in their second season, like Jaron Jackson, is going to be in next season. I, I think a huge, huge leap forward is coming for him. I think staying on the court will be improved significantly for Jackson. Um, yeah, what he did as a rookie was impressive. Still, you know, had some issues with guys like Jermichael Green, you know, providing solidness uh, behind him, limiting his on-off stuff. But defensively, when you're as already as good as what Jackson is, it's the offensive part of your game that's going to have to come. And to me, he's a pretty solid top 100 pick for next season with significant top 50 upside. And people won't be picking him in that top 50 range because you shouldn't you shouldn't be taking him in that area but i reckon he's got a real opportunity to get to that spot as we uh as we move forward he still has a, a long way to go in a lot of what he does and that's fine we, we understand that as a rookie but coming in with really strong you know, block percentage and steal percentage as a rookie, you know, really strong defensive stuff and that offensive game, when it comes around, can he top out as a 20-point-per-game guy, 1.63, seven boards, plus two blocks and 1.2 steals, and you know, maybe he gets to two assists. That's always going to hold him back with efficiency. There's a really, really excellent player lying in there with Jaron Jackson Jr., Next up is Kyle Anderson, who came across from San Antonio with a big opportunity to be the starting small forward. Dealt with an Achilles injury in the preseason. Bickerstaff also mishandled him, putting Chandler Parsons as a starter for God knows what reason. Eventually, Anderson worked his way back into that starting lineup, played 30 minutes a night, or just a shade under 30 minutes a night, and was the 109th ranked player. So overall, a little bit of a disappointment in terms of his overall ranking. Shot the ball horribly from the line, just 58%, but 54 from the field, 27 from three is disgusting, but eight, six, and three with 1.3 steals and one block. This is the sort of overall rotisserie type production that Kyle Anderson is able to do, but that shoulder issue really ruined his season, and the start of the season was ruined by Bickerstaff as well. I still think that he will come in and start and play 31 minutes a night next season and probably push to crack the top 100, but it was definitely a step back from where he was as a member of the Spurs, in large part because he shot 
down from 58% from the line. Sorry, he went down to 58% from the line from 71. The two years before, he was at 79 and 75. So really no reason for him to have been that poor of a free throw shooter. He also, despite not being a good shooter, had been at least a 32% three-point shooter in each of the previous three seasons and down to 27 this year. He's also been relatively healthy, 78, 72, and 74 games until this year playing 43. He's going to slide a lot in drafts. I think that the free throw percentage, the three-point percentage, the games played, the shoulder obviously was a concern there. The minutes were all down, and I think we see all of those things, games, minutes, free throw percentage, three-point percentage, all rise up, and if Conley goes, a little bit more ball handling goes into his hands. I could act, I could realistically see a top 60 season from Anderson next season. I'm not suggesting that that's anywhere near where he should be drafted, but with all the way that the things are, are playing out for this Memphis team, I think that opportunity is going to be there. Negative 0.36 PIPM, not great, but still you know okay in the in the context of this team. He was a plus, oh sorry, a negative 0.5 on off. There were definitely some things he needed to work on, but I think that we are going to see an improvement from him next season. He's still just 25 years of age as well. Justin Holiday came across from Chicago, was a disaster. 116th ranked player overall, in large part because of his contributions in Chicago, but shot just 39% from the field. 90% from the line is good, 35% from three is okay. His value is really just all about threes and steals. 10.5 points with two threes, four rebounds, under two assists, 1.5 steals in 32 minutes. I don't see him getting 32 minutes a night next season considering just how bad he was in Memphis, and he was piss poor. He couldn't hit shots. Defensively, he he struggled. He was a negative 1.9 on-off, which is not, obviously not a great number. Negative 2.06 uh, PIPM, negative on the defensive end. He struggled defensively. He couldn't hit his shots. He just was not the player that they paid those two premium second-round picks to get. And now he's an unrestricted free agent, and he's already past the age of 30. I think this is the last time we'll ever see Justin Holiday as being a standard league player, where he finished inside the top 120. I don't see that happening again for him moving forward. Just really a poor, poor year for Holiday. And um, yeah, when his value is based entirely on steals, I think even more like a Kent Bazemore sort of a guy who had this stretch with the steals and blocks, or sorry, steals and threes coming in with value there. And then when those minutes drop, which I think from 32, he goes down to 26, 25 a night next season pretty comfortably, his relevance pretty much disappears after that. D-line Wright's an interesting one, 163rd overall player. Really struggled in Toronto, saw most of his minutes go to Fred Van Vliet. We saw him the year before play 22 minutes a night and be a really key option when Kyle Lowry went down, but then traded to Toronto, so from Toronto to Memphis. And when Mike Conley went out, started a point guard and put up really good numbers. Now he can play the one, he can play the two, he can play the three. With the potential that Conley's gone and potentially Avery Bradley gone as well, I think that DeLon Wright as the key piece in that Marcus Sol trade along with Jonas Valanciunas, they'll look to bring him back as a restricted free agent. I think we're gonna get, gonna get good numbers. In the time he was in Memphis, he was a top 75, sorry, he was the 76th ranked player. Uh, in 31 minutes, averaging 12, five and a half and five and a half with 1.6 steals. He blocked shots, 0.6 blocks. The three point shooting is a problem. He was just 29.8% over the course of the season. Under that uh, during his time in Memphis, doesn't take many of them, but his ability to score a bit, rebounds, assists, steals and blocks, his free throws at a solid enough rate as well. He was 83 last season, 79% this season. I really think DeLon Wright can be a decent enough player. A plus 1.26 PIPM is a strong number. A plus 4.4 on-off during his time in Memphis is really strong. And with the likelihood that Conley's gone, and we don't know who's coming back, but I think we should be at least mentally preparing for the fact that DeLon Wright is the starting point guard for this Grizzlies team next season. That makes him a top 100 point guard, in my opinion. Not top 100 point guard top 100 player with the potential to push into the top 60. I think he's probably only going to have that ability or that role for two seasons max. So when you're looking long-term in Dynasty, that's where he is. But I love what he can do on the court. He can contribute right across the board. He's a better roto than head-to-head -head guy. But still, he should be at least a top 100 player for next season and the season after. But so much could change. This team could jump up to pick number two and get Jar Morant in the draft. And yeah, that changes everything for his uh, trajectory moving forward. But everything at this point is looking pretty okay for DeLon Wright. Bruno Caboclo, another player, former Toronto guy that was signed during the season, played pretty well during the G League and had his moments this year, no doubt. His best stretch as an NBA player, 34 games, 24 minutes, eight and four and a half with one and a half threes. He blocked a shot a game. 
uh, had a true shooting of 57%, and he looked comfortable out there. A uh, PIPM of pretty much zero, so a neutral guy there provided some wins, was a plus 4.5 on court. Really strong stuff from Caboclo, and over the last 15 games where he played 27 minutes a night, he snuck inside the top 110, averaging 11 and 6 with two threes and a block and half a steal. Jaron Jackson's going to be back next season. Kyle Anderson's going to be back. And that's where he was getting his minutes, at the three and the four. So Bruno, in those 27 minutes a game over the last 15 games, it's going to be a real stretch for him to get get to that amount of playing time. But I imagine that he will be in the rotation. They'd be smart to put him into the rotation ahead of Chandler Parsons. And they're both going to be competing for those minutes behind Anderson and Jackson, which is a little bit of a worry for Bruno. But with the way that he played, you should have at least some encouragement for deeper leagues that he's going to be at least a regular every night part of the rotation. And the steps forward that he took this season were obviously impressive. And that shot blocking from a small forward eligible player is is really hard to find. He also showed you know, some improvement from three, hitting 38% of them. That's yeah, pretty impressive. Now, some of his good shooting... Um, yeah, it could be explained away a little bit flukily there. But on his mid-range twos, he hit just 31%. Now, it's only on 26 attempts. He didn't finish well at the rim. So he's actually got improvement in him in all those areas and being able to hit those two-pointers. But I thought it was really impressive stuff from Bruno. We also saw a resurgence from Joachim Noah, who was the 215th ranked player, 17 minutes a game, had some moments where he was a standard league guy, averaging seven, five and a half with two assists. He blocked 0.7 shots in those 17 minutes, 52 and 72. And getting 52% from the field from Joachim Noah is massive. This is a guy whose shooting was so, so poor over the last couple of seasons with the Knicks. We didn't think we'd ever see him really playing in the NBA again. And over the last 16 games of the season, he was a top 100 player, averaging 11 and 8 with three and a half assists and a block with that really, really strong field goal percentage. Yeah, really impressive stuff from Noah. Yeah, will he find himself back as a backup center on this team? I think that's a possibility behind Valanciunas playing 20 minutes a night, which puts him in those deeper league considerations. But Noah is already 34 years of age. You'd think maybe one or two seasons left in him, but it was good to see him uh, as a guy that you know, many people you know, love as a player and as a bloke, good to see him in there doing what he does. A plus three on off during his time in Memphis, a positive PIPM, a defensive force. I think they'd look to bring him back as that backup center, helping to tutor uh, Jaron Jackson Jr., helping Jonas Valanciunas, and being that deeper league guy who, when guys get hurt or guys are out, you can stream in and get a little bit of value from. So really impressive stuff. Also impressive was Avery Bradley, who was literally the worst starter in the entire NBA all of last season and all of this season until he came across from the Clippers in that trade. Now, I was critical of Bradley so much this season because he was bad. There was no doubt about that. But the shot started to fall in Memphis. He was a, the 90th ranked player during his time in Memphis in only 14 games, but 32 minutes, 16, 3, and 4 with a steal. That's because he shot 38% from three and 46% overall and 92% from the line. Last season, he shot 41% overall. This season, he shot 41% overall. So do we look at the 110-game sample or the 14-game sample as to whether he is now a good shooter or not? That That is the concern there with Avery Bradley. The one season he had in Boston where he was a good rebounder, that seems to have disappeared. He was still, in his time in Memphis, a negative player. Defensively, he struggled. A negative 1.2 PIPM is not a great number. A negative 1.7 with his on-off stuff. Still, despite him coming out there and putting up some good shooting nights, and you're going, well, shit, what's happening here with Avery Bradley? Multiple 20-point performances, a 30-point game as well, where he went 33-6-6. Six and six. He was generating steals. He was getting assists at a higher level. Um, it really some good performances and then he got hurt and, uh, and never returned during the season so I think he's, he's, he could be a little bit fool's goldy if people are expecting that to return but I also do think there's a significant chance he finishes the season higher than his season rank of 224 for this upcoming year it was a big step forward for Bradley he is still 28 but if the Grizzlies want to save some money they can cut him save 10 million dollars on that deal and give minutes to guys like Tyler Dorsey or depending on what they do with uh, you know, the, the, the draft. But again, they've got limited draft assets too. So I could see a scenario where Bradley is back. He's starting at the two alongside DeLon Wright and Kyle Anderson and would be an interesting 14-team league guy. But it's the shooting that's all going to be really a part of it. But if Conley goes, maybe he can still generate some of those assists we saw at the end of the season. But he has never been a good passer. So again, a 14-game sample size, I worry that that's not going to be replicable. But his time in Memphis, two assists. 6, 5, 1, 2, 3, 7, 5, 7, 3, 6, 1, 5. There's some really good assist numbers there. His, uh, and for, for contrast, 
His last five games in LA, 0-1-2-0-1 uh, in terms of assists. So not a guy that really has been able to generate assists at any point in his career, but for some reason was able to do it during that time in Memphis. And, and I'm not really sure why that big change happened in the way that he was able to play, but it was interesting. And for his time in Memphis, he was in the 92nd percentile in assist percentage. So yeah, that's something there. Chandler Parsons turned 30 during the season, played 20 minutes a game in his 25 uh, games, seven and a half, three rebounds, 0.8 steals, shot poorly, 37 and 88, including 31% from feet. Now, last year, he was a very good three-point shooter. He had his issues with the team. He refused to go down to the G League. He said he was healthy. They wouldn't play him. One more year left on that contract for... Um, for Parsons at $25 million. It's going to be hard to trade him away. I don't think they should be looking to invest too much in a 30-year-old who can't stay healthy and has really dropped off in his level of play, which is sad because he was a he was a really good player in Dallas and in Houston, and injuries have absolutely killed his career, and I don't think we should be expecting any sort of resurgence. Tyler Zeller, I don't know why they signed him and bothered to play him, although I guess they needed the center depth with Valanciunas out. And then Ivan Rabb, who had his opportunities and I believe squandered them. He is only 22 years of age, but only 15 minutes a night, 6 and 4. Defensive stats are, are always going to be a problem for Rab. He was a negative in PIPM. He was a, a negative 3.6 on off. There is still some hope for him to work into a, a backup guy, and they, they would love him to push into that backup role ahead of someone like Noah and be there because he is a younger player. But I, I think we should be you know, really limiting our expectations for Ivan Rab. Another guy that came across in a trade was CJ Miles. He has picked up his player option already. 32 years of age for Miles, six points in his 16 minutes, but he does nothing else apart from hit threes. Even then, he hit them at just 33% last season, a little bit disappointing. Only played 294 minutes in Memphis, but he was a positive guy during that time, had some pretty good games, and as I said, a plus 10 on off during that time in Memphis uh, is pretty impressive. But overall, he is that deep league three-point streamer who, uh, at his advanced age, probably doesn't have too much of an impact moving forward. Javon Carter and Dylan Brooks, two young guys, both 23 years of age. Carter, uh, really disappointing, I thought, this season. 30% from the field, 27% uh, on his two-pointers. There is going to be an opportunity for him to move into a backup point guard role next season if Conley is gone. And then Dylan Brooks, a guy who had a really strong rookie season. I'm not high on Dylan Brooks as a player at all. Bickerstaff didn't really use him very much this season, even when he was healthy. His minutes were down, just 18 minutes a game in the 18, minute, 18 games that he played. He really had a strong end to his rookie season when everyone was out and his usage and ball touches were through the roof. He is never going to be that player moving forward, so don't expect him to be a standard league guy. But if they do believe in Brooks and they cut Avery Bradley, he could come back as the starting shooting guard. It would probably make a lot of sense for them to at least try that and see what happens. But even then, he fits more into the Poor, really poor man's Malcolm Brogdon. He's not a standard league sort of a guy, but if he moves into that area, but he could be like a 14 team league player that we could have a look at and see. But I think that, you know, you've got to look at his rookie season, you look at his second season, he's somewhere in between both of those because he did really struggle last year. But the fact that he just couldn't get any minutes despite not having a, a true star or even good player ahead of him at that position is, uh, is somewhat of a concern. Tyler Dorsey is a score-only sort of a player, came across from Atlanta. It was a good trade for them in terms of uh, trading him for Shelvin Mack, but he's not a he's not a good long-term prospect. He does very little on the court. He can struggle defensively. He's not a good passer. He's not a good rebounder. He's not a good defender. He scores, and he, he much like Brooks, he needs to be in a situation where the team has packed it away, and he's getting every touch possible, and even then, he struggles. I'm not big on Tyler Dorsey long-term. I thought you didn't know what Anabe did okay, but just couldn't shoot. 29% from the field during his uh, 15 games and 12 minutes per night, and that will uh, wrap, it up, wrap it up for this team. A lot of questions. I imagine Conley's gone. They might get a draft pick in the top four. They might lose their draft pick altogether. Uh, returning players of Jaron Jackson and Kyle Anson are looking to take a, a big step forward uh, along with a big opportunity potentially happening for DeLon Wright. Make sure you are subscribing to this podcast, Locked On Fantasy Basketball, on the Himalaya podcast app. You can also find us on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or on Spotify. And subscribe on YouTube. Give it a thumbs up. Leave a comment. Hit that bell for notifications as well. Follow me on Twitter at RedRock underscore B-Ball. Guys, we are done here. Thank you so much for listening, everyone. See ya.